Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Anil Malhotra. I'm a cardiac risk in the Young Research Fellow um, based at St. George's and also up at Wembley working with the Football Association, the English Football Association, um, on their cardiac screening program. Now, we've heard from Pro Professor Corrado on the benefits of mass participation screening. And in keeping with that, the FA runs the largest mandatory UK-based screening program for elite athletes. And this is aimed for all youth academy players age 16 or around, uh, around that age. And that's in all leagues, ranging from the Premier League down to the Championship and Leagues 1 and 2. The programme was initiated in 97, 1997, following the tragic death of a young chap called John Marshall, um, who died from ARVC just two days after signing his professional contract with Everton Football Club. And he also represented England nationally. So in this vein, the Players Football Association, i.e. the PFA, have funded this project, which has been running for the last 17 years. And I hope to give a snapshot of what we are doing from there on in. The um, screening itself comprises of a health questionnaire and physical examination, a 12-lead ECG, and a transthoracic echocardiogram. And not only do we screen league players, but also national players at all levels now, ranging from under-15s, men, and increasingly now women, and also disability players as well. Now, I couldn't find a picture of the England's first team actually winning anything recently. I don't think 1966 counts as a, uh, as a cardiac screening era, but we have to make do with the laudable achievements of the under-17s team at the European Championships earlier this year. So the protocol itself, these tests are then reviewed by a consultant cardiologist who's on the FA's consensus panel. Um, and any abnormality that's detected is then um, tailored so that patient would be referred for further investigations um, decided by that sports cardiologist. Any equivocal results thereafter or athletes that fall into the so-called gray zone are further discussed with the FA consensus panel, which is chaired by Professor Sharma. And further decisions related to any advice on disqualification or even interventions are made from a thorough discussion with this panel. And concurrently, I'm compiling a database of all these athletes um, uh, according to their ethnicity, demographics, and also the results that we have found thus far. And I intend to give a snapshot of this with the next few slides. So this graph shows that since the inception of the programme, we can see a gradual increase in the number of players screened every season, and it accumulates to about 15,000 players in total. Um, the reason why the increase, uh, that there have been increasing numbers gradually is because um, there has been more funding given to grassroots level, therefore more and more young players are participating and available for clubs to sign, and also there's more representation at national level as well. Uh, as I mentioned, ranging from the under-15s up to the first teams in both sexes and in the disability players. Now, this slide shows the number of referrals that have been made that were previously based perhaps on experience, but then we were given the consensus guidelines in 2010, which was shortly followed by a spate of high-profile sudden cardiac arrests on the pitch, which may account for that big jump in referrals. But it'll be interesting to see how the Seattle criteria and the more recently published by my colleague, Dr. Nabil Sheikh, who's also part of Prof. Re um, Prof Sharma's research group earlier this year in circulation, how these criteria will have an effect with the aim to not only streamline further referrals, but also reduce the false positive rates. Now, we can see that I've databased 8,000 footballers thus far, and the mean age is around seven, uh, 16 years, but ranges a bit lower and a few years above. And out of nearly 8,500 people, the majority comprise of males. And from the group, once we take a small proportion of disability players out, we can see that 7.5%, i.e. 600 male footballers, required further evaluation, according to the cardiologist. And this compared to 5.6% of females. Now, this pie chart shows that 64% of these further referrals in males were based on the ECG alone. So in keeping with what Dr. Lawless actually said, the ECG is, uh, or seems to be, uh, an effective tool for picking up abnormalities at pre-participation screening. 
we can see that 29% were due to echocardiography alone, and only 5% were due to both an abnormality on the ECG and echocardiogram. Interestingly, just 2% of further referrals in men were, um, were referred on the basis of their health questionnaire and physical examination alone. And if we look at these ECG abnormalities further, the majority of conditions were due to T-wave inversion, followed by a fifth, which were due to accessory pathways, suspected WPW, and then other conduction abnormalities for 8%, followed by axis deviation and ectopy in a smaller proportion. And if you also look at the echocardiographic abnormalities, we can see that left ventricular hypertrophy accounted for a third of the referrals for further evaluation, followed by valvular pathology, and then left ventricular dilatation, and then congenital abnormalities and trabeculations in a small proportion. So if we look at these 600 men who were evaluated further, we can see that some were given the all clear straight away, but we did identify three cases of HCM, one of ARVC, 0.9% was the prevalence of WPW, and then a small proportion of congenital abnormalities, and 44 of the cases had valvular pathology, but there was no clear diagnosis as of yet in the 5.2%, so that is where the follow-up is being undertaken. If we look at the females in which we have followed them, apart of the 24 cases that were referred for further evaluation, no clear diagnosis was, um, was apparent in 11, and the majority of those were discharged. Yet in those with a condition identified, the majority, the vast majority, were given the all clear with a regular review. But there was one case of a player with long QT syndrome who was reluctant to undergo further testing and then self-selected, so she actually decided herself that she would rather not participate. And looking at this group in more detail, about a third of these females had valvular pathology as the cause of their referral and one was given the all clear, with the rest remaining under regular review. Repolarization abnormalities accounted for the vast majority of um, further referrals, with, again, most people being kept under further review. And then structural and electrical defects, with the aforementioned long QT case, who has self-selected or self-decided not to participate, um, and then the other case is under regular review. Now, not only can we glean information about the follow-ups, but we can also look at the normal parameters, especially in the adolescent heart, which is a relatively understudied population in these teenagers. And we can see here that the maximum left ventricular wall thickness does have a normal distribution, but that depends on ethnicity. And not only are we following up those, patients, those players who've got a left ventricular wall thickness above conventional parameters, but also, in particular, those who lie more than two standard deviations above the mean. So that's 2.4% in our black players and 4.3% in our Caucasian. And we're doing something similar with the left ventricular end diastolic diameter as well to try to follow these players up to see whether someone has actually presented now with a phenotypic manifestation of dilated cardiomyopathy. So going further, we are going to continue to gain more information regarding these follow-ups and also ascertain the false negative rates as well, which is very important. We're going to glean more information about the adolescent heart and the FA are also introducing a new protocol of screening at aged 18 and 20, so during the later ages of physiological development with an ECG only to try to ascertain whether a cardiomyopathy may present. I'd like to thank Sue Cheadle, who's the FA screening coordinator, as well as the doctors who've helped facilitate the FA experience of pre-participation screening. Thank you.